Dale Zeterik, owner of Farpoint Farms here in the mountains of North Carolina, and today we're getting domestic. That's right, we're going to be doing some canning today. Today I'm going to be canning chicken because yesterday we processed a bunch of our birds and it is time to do preservation. Now if you're going to be a homesteader or you're interested in long-term food preservation, this is going to become a routine, a part of your life. Every couple of months, be it vegetables or meats, you're going to have to do some canning. Now I have what's called a pressure canner here, it's a relatively large one. I don't know the brand of it, but you can look these up. They're available on eBay, online, Amazon, that kind of thing. Now, I'm at a higher elevation, so I have a 15 PSI blow-off valve. Uh, at lower elevations, sometimes you can go with 12, but for today, we'll be doing 15. Now, as far as equipment you're going to need, obviously, your cans, which are your jars. I've got some quart-sized and some pint-sized jars here. I've already taken the time to cut up the chicken. This is what it looks like here, and I'm going to be doing what's called cold pack, canning, which is to take raw foods, put them into the cans, and then pressure can them from the start. Now you can do hot pack. The advantage of hot pack is you can fit a little more chicken into each jar, but in this case, uh, it's saving a step. It's a little easier for me to just go ahead and do this all in one shot, so I'm going to do cold pack canning. Okay, so as far as the steps, and you can kind of pre-stage some of this stuff like I have here to save a little bit of time. Once this thing gets going, it's, it's 90 minutes, so you'll have plenty of time in between the actual getting it into this thing and getting it back out. You're actually looking at more like two hours, probably even a little bit more than two hours, and I'll explain why that is. But to start with, you want to get your oven going to about 200 degrees, so mine's going to start warming up now. I'm not going to do anything with the pressure cooker other than add water. Here's a picture of the water that I've added to it. It's about two to three inches. Now double check because on some of these models it may be less or it may be more. But in general, if you're a little over what you're supposed to be, that's okay. If you're a little under, that's where you could run into problems. So again, I've got about two inches, two and a half inches in here right now. And I'm going to just have the lid set off the side. I've already got my chicken cut up and I've already cleaned all of my jars for the first batch. It's important that everything is sterile. Very important. So everything's been cleaned. The reason I'm warming up the oven is we're going to take these jars, which still have a little bit of moisture in them, we're going to flip them back over, I'm going to put them on a tray, we're going to put them in the oven and let them cook at 200 degrees. That will help sterilize anything that got missed by the cleaning process. While that's happening, I'm going to boil some water here in the microwave, and then I'm going to use that to sterilize the jarring equipment, the canning equipment, which is you know a funnel, a magnetic end, my tongs for getting the jars in and out of the water bath, and I've got my lids and my, uh, my rings already in that bucket right there. Right here, you'll see, here's a picture of all that stuff separated. But you're going to put boiling water in that and allow that to sit for a while too. So by the time everything is ready, everything should be sterilized. When I take the jars out of the oven, they'll be ready to have the chicken put in. Once they're in, these will be nicely uh, softened up and ready to go on. I'll screw the lids on. We'll put it in there, seal it, turn it on, and get it up to 15 PSI. So let's get started, okay? I'm just going to grab this. I'm going to put my jars on there. Now you want to inspect your jars and make sure there's no cracks around the lips. Anything that could be defective that could cause a problem, you want that to be uh, taken care of. So if you see a split or a crack under pressure, that's going to become a much bigger issue. We don't want that to happen. So just going to inspect it. You can put your finger around there make sure there's no cuts. Looking at those. I think this fits eight, but it might fit nine. I'm always going to give an extra one in case something goes wrong in the process. If I drop one, and so on and so forth. If you can find them, the wide mouth jars are much easier. And the wide mouth versus the narrow mouth jars are a lot easier for packing and getting the meat back out when you're done. But if for some reason you don't have wide mouth, which I have a few, kind of four and four is what I ended up with here today, um, both will work. Okay, go ahead and stick those in the oven. We're going to let those cook for about 15 minutes. There we go. We'll let that start. Now, you don't want to get the hot water rolling in this thing. It would save some time. And if you're going to hot pack, you're probably okay to do that. But if you're going to cold pack and you have boiling water or near boiling water and you take those cold jars full of cold meat and stick them in there, you're likely to have a blowout. Something's going to crack or break and you're going to make a mess and that's no good. So we're not going to start that. Again, this adds a little bit of time on the cooking part. But once this thing gets going, you wait till you hear the whistling of that thing when it hits 15 PSI. You start your timer at 90 minutes and let it roll. Okay. The next thing I'm going to do is I've got all my utensils that I'm going to be using, and I'm going to take those and I'm going to get a jar 
a big cup of water here, about four cups worth. I'll fill that up in the sink and get it going in the microwave. Take about five minutes for it to reach a full boil. All right, my five minutes is up. I'm gonna go ahead and take this out. Pour that in here and let that do its thing. So I've got four cups of boiling water working their way on this mess. I'm gonna go ahead and get another four cups started. Another five minutes in there. So that'll leave us with five minutes left when this is all done. And uh, we'll be ready to start canning. So I'll get that going again. This will soak. Once that's done, I'll take the canning equipment itself and I'll put it into that second jar. This will just be lids and bands. Now you want to have these bands in there because that seal that's on there, it helps moisten it up, soften it up with that heat. So we're going to have that in there. So as well as sterilizing it, it's also kind of preparing it for the canning process. Meanwhile, our chicken's sitting out, hopefully getting a little warmer. It's been in the fridge all night. And when we're done, we'll be ready to start putting this stuff together. So I'll see you in five minutes. Okay. Now we've got two things full of boiling water. And like I said before, I'm going to go ahead and transfer some of this stuff over. Basically, I'm going to put my canning equipment into there to finish that up. Let that get in there. There's my magnet. I'll go ahead and stir this around. How does that is? Just want to make sure all that's done. Now I'm going to move the camera over here because it is about two minutes away from pulling the jars who are now sterilized out. I'll put them onto the sheet here that I have, and we'll start uh, we'll start packing these things full of chicken. That goes without saying that those jars are going to be quite hot. <laughs> Pull that down a little bit so it's in view. Okay. I'm going to take our uh, funnel here, go ahead and put it in the first jar, and we will start putting meat into the jars. Now you want to get as much as you can into there because it will cook down. Now when you do a cold pack like this, you don't need to add water. Uh, most of the time people do add a little bit of salt. I might add just a smidge. I'm not a huge fan of pre-salting my food. You never really know what it's going to turn into. But we'll go ahead and we're going to make a run and we'll fill all these up. Then we'll come back if we have leftover chicken and we will uh, pack it down, see what else we can get in there. You want to leave yourself about an inch of headspace on these. I don't know if any of you guys have pets. It's amazing to me that you can have a cat or a dog that's dead asleep, but they hear that sound of raw meat and they wake up and come running. It's always good to cut up a little extra. If you do run short, you can switch from a uh, quart jar to a pint jar, or vice versa. That's going to about do it. Then we'll go back around here and top off. And like I'm going to press down. I'm going to get a, a knife here and kind of push down on all this stuff, and we'll just top it off with whatever we have left. And this is just kind of pack it down. Get any air pocket out of the way. And set that off. More pieces. They're all pretty well packed in there. Just just a little bit of space. Just want to maximize the volume. This, this stuff takes up room on your shelves. Now I have a cellar, and I'm going to make a video of that at some point. A storage cellar that has all my long-term storage, canned goods, dried goods, uh, homemade canned goods, that kind of stuff. So, and and you know, if you're interested in that sort of thing, I can make more videos on it. But Long-term food preservation, again, if you're a homesteader, this is kind of this is kind of part of it. If you're into prepping or survivalism, that those are also, uh, I guess, skill sets you might want to have. Okay, so there it is. I'm going to wash my hands, and we're going to clean these jars off, and it'll be time to start canning. All right, I got my two, two bottles of very hot water here. You know, I've got the one that has the canning equipment in it. This one has the uh, lids. So you're going to touch the lids here. You're going to try to do this just with a magnet. Now it's easier said than done, but if you can, you do want to do that. But before you put those on, you want to wipe this down. You can use the hot water that you've got, if I can find it. There we go. And uh, I'll just take a paper towel like so, and I'll wet the edge of it. And I'll go around and clean in case any like chicken juice or anything like that got on these. I'm just going to clean those lids off. That way we get a nice good seal. Hopefully. Now the good news is, uh, none of this goes to waste. If you end up canning this stuff, and when you open it up, if it doesn't seal properly, 
you still have 24 hours. You just treat it like any kind of leftovers at that point. Okay, so I've got my can. I'm going to put those on. You're going to tighten them down, but you're not going crazy. You know, don't want to go super tight because you want to allow the air that's in there to escape. This process does take some time, there's no doubt about it, but the payoff is pretty nice. Uh, let's say you didn't raise your own animals. Let's say you just went to the store and bought uh, chicken or beef or whatever is on sale and you wanted to store it without having to uh, without having to keep it refrigerated or frozen. Well, you could do this as well. And uh, let me tell you, although you do have some power usage when you're cooking this stuff, once it's cooked, you have zero power requirement in order to keep this stuff from going bad. Uh, you know, I think they say nutritionally this stuff lasts at least three years on the shelf. The truth is, any canned good, if it's good when it comes out of the canner, it'll be good 25 years from now. As long as the seals don't break, this is as good as any canned goods. There we go. Everything is ready to go. Now it is time to put it into the water, get the water boiling, and the long wait begins. Okay. <laughs> so it's time to start cooking now. We got our water again, two and a half inches, two inches to three inches. And double check on your pressure canners because some of these require more or less. But in this case, that's what it's asking for and that's what it's got. I'm going to go ahead and start the burner. We'll get it rolling. And we'll turn this down. Once this thing reaches 15 PSI, you don't want to leave this thing on full boil because there's the opportunity for it to create more pressure than it's allowed to burn off and uh, through those holes. So you'll want to cut it down to where it's just maintaining that 15 PSI. Now because we're cold packing, I can actually just take these jars and put them directly into the water since the water is about lukewarm. But there you go. I'm going to bring that close to the camera. You can see they're fairly well packed. There's about an inch of space there. And, uh, and that'll cook down when it's in there. It'll also create its own juices. You'll notice I didn't add any water. I decided not to add any salt to this. You certainly can, but again, it's not necessary. We'll go ahead and, and start putting these into the tank. Depending on the size of your pressure canner, you can fit anywhere from six to nine of these. I believe this is a uh, seven unit, which is exactly how many jars we have today. You get the camera up close so you can see. This ended up actually submerging just over the water line because of the water displacement value, but it's not necessary for these jars to be completely submerged in water. In fact, I believe it's recommended that there's be a little bit above the water line, but uh, this isn't water bath canning, this is pressure canning. It's a pretty tight fit, but they're all in there. So we're going to go ahead and put our uh, lid on, and it'll be time to let the clock do its work. Now hopefully you guys can see this. This is uh, your pressure relief valve. Uh, when it goes to cool off, this thing is going to continue on. If for some reason you don't see that valve open relatively quickly after starting this process, be worried. That's That's got to open or you'll create too much pressure. Now on this model, some are gauges, uh, some are dials. This one just has a weighted top. Again, I'm at 3,500 feet, so I have a 15 PSI gauge here. This is your gauge itself. On the bottom of these units, there's a rubber gasket. You do want to check that gasket and make sure that nothing's happened to it from sitting or, you know, a critter getting to it or whatnot. In this case, I've already done all that, so we're good to go. So I'll go ahead and install this. And lock it to seal. Place that on there. And let the, let the, let the time do its thing. 90 minutes from the time that this hits 15 PSI. In the meantime, I've got another batch that I'm going to get ready to cook, which I won't be filming, but I'll go ahead and clean those jars up and do some cleaning around the house, get that kind of stuff ready as far as getting all that chicken, uh, you know, raw chicken juices that may have gotten lost on the counter. So there's plenty to do while it's cooking, but this is a process. This is, uh, you know, to do one batch, you're looking close to half a day. Okay, to give you an idea of the time frame involved in all this, I would say it's been probably about seven minutes or so, and... Uh, that's come up, which is good, that's what we want. And the pressure has started to rise on the gauge. Now, it, you know, this is a new stove, so uh, on the old stove, which was a glass top, which cooked considerably slower, it took about 30 minutes from the time it started to build pressure to the time it hit 15. But uh, this is a gas, and I, and I bet you it gets there a little quicker than that. But we'll find out. Okay, here we are. 
It has reached 15 PSI, and uh, my little top here started to dance. That's good. And that's a very simplistic design. This is just a weighted piece of metal that sits over a vent hole, and it requires 15 PSI of air pressure in order to counteract the weight that's in that little piece. That's how it works. It's simple, but it works. So our vent is still good. And we know we have pressure. We're at 15 PSI. I'm going to cut my temperature back now to about a three and a half, four. We'll see how it plays out from there. I'm setting my microwave timer to 90 minutes starting about now. We'll come back and check on this and uh, this should be it. You should probably not let this thing alone for the full 90 minutes. I would give it five or 10 minutes and come and check this again. If for some reason this gauge has climbed past 15 PSI, turn your heat down more. For some reason it's gone down below 15 psi, turn your heat up slightly and give it an extra 5 or 10 minutes as far as cook time goes. Now uh, you don't want when this is over with to just turn the gas off, turn turn the temperature down and open this up because you'll be badly hurt. Uh, the pressure, the steam, all that stuff will probably blow the lid right off and really hurt you. You don't want that to happen. You want to just play the patience game and let this thing sit. It will slowly creep its way back down to zero. You'll know that all the pressure has left the device when this valve sits back down flat. And any kind of rushing to that, if you were to manually, if you take that metal off there and let it decompress at a more rapid pace, you run a very high risk of the cans inside, the jars, shattering from the rapid decompression. Same thing if it gets down to 3 or 4 PSI and you pull the lid off of this thing, you may not kill yourself or be badly burned, but chances are that rapid decompression will cause those jars to shatter. And we don't want that to happen, so we're just going to do it the right way. We'll let it cook for 90 minutes, I'll check on it every few, and we'll come back, shut it down, let it cool all the way off, and we'll be almost done. Okay, I don't know how well you can hear me over the sound of this thing. But it's been 90 minutes and a few extra just to be sure. I'm going to go ahead and shut this thing off. And now I'm not going to do anything. We're going to wait. And my guess is it's about 12, we'll call it 1230 on this clock. I bet it's a half hour before this thing loses enough pressure to take the lid off. But we'll come back and we'll check and see. Remember, patience is key here. You don't want to take this thing off and blow up and really hurt yourself. You don't want to take it off even when it's two pounds of pressure in there. Because you can decompress those cans and blow up the jars and waste all the time and effort we put into it. So, check back in a little bit. Well, all right, it's been an hour since we turned the uh, stove off. That's how long it took for the uh, pressure to completely bleed off of this thing. Now remember, when you unscrew the lid on this, that it's still gonna be extremely hot, still a lot of steam and vapor. So I'm gonna use uh, a towel here and hopefully I won't burn myself too badly. But we'll get the lid off and we'll see. I see if anything broke you never know uh, you know even though I inspected the jars things happen now let's take a look still extremely hot in here let me get the camera off the tripod here and I'll show you what it looks like a lot of a lot of a lot of hotness a lot of heat there it is now I don't know if it shows up on the video or not but those cans internally are still boiling and probably will for some time to come but now I'm going to take my mason jar and take them out, put them on a drying rack, and uh, throw a towel over them, and we'll just forget about them. And as long as the seals pull a vacuum, success. All right, I've got my tongs. Now this kit that had the funnel and the little magnet and this piece, yeah, I got that on Amazon. They're very inexpensive, but it's really helpful for grabbing onto these things. Woo, and they're hot. And we'll just put these on a rack. These are like cookie sheets, cookie racks. They work just fine for this as well. Looks like they came out really nicely. There we go. So those will continue to do their thing. You can see uh, they're still boiling here. And uh, that's okay. I'm going to throw this over them. So if I were to have an explosion at this point or a glass were to break, it would not uh, come out and hit me. Same with the liquid. It would probably spill downward, but it probably wouldn't be too dangerous. And the reason I'm doing that is I've got another batch that I have to make today. So uh, that's it. You have just learned how to pressure can chicken, pork, venison, beef, whatever you want to can. You can can hot dogs. Uh, it's amazing. <laughs> anyway, I am Eric, owner of Farpoint Farms. I hope you got some use out of this video. I know there are other canning videos out there, but probably not too many with guys doing the canning. But if you want to be a homesteader, if you want to be a prepper or survivalist or whatever it is you want to be, or you're just frugal, and let's face it, being cheap is probably the number one reason you would want to uh, buy large amounts of food and, and store them long term. People buy 
in bulk and they freeze or they can. So these are uh, strategies that we can do to save money no matter what your background is. Even if you live in an apartment in the middle of a city, you can can foods, throw them in a closet, and now you have chicken for chicken dinners anytime you want. That's it. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, perhaps you will think about liking and subscribing because there will be many more just like it. Something that needs a little fixing on both.